Sylvia and me. 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 When a man goes to post bond, the women in his life rally around to help him make bond. When a woman is ready to post bond, the men in her life do not rally around and try to help her post bond. And so we see many more women because they're financially, they're marginalized. They don't have the money for the bond to be able to get out while they're waiting for a court date. So we see these families impacted by women who have not been sentenced, who have not been found guilty, but their families are being impacted immediately. Hi, I'm Sylvia Beckerman, host of the podcast series, Sylvia and Me. Conversations with inspiring, empowering women. Well, hello, I'm Stephanie Covington. I'm the co-director of the Center for Gender and Justice that's located here in Southern California. And I just recently have published a new book called Hidden Healers, The Unexpected Ways Women Survive Prison by Helping Each Other. So welcome to Sylvia and me. Stephanie, thank you so much for joining me here today. Um, and you are an internationally recognized clinician, author, organizational consultant, and lecturer. Um, and you're a pioneer in the fields of addiction, trauma, and recovery. And as you mentioned, you're, you just wrote a book, or actually it was just published, Hidden Healers, and it's specifically about women in our prison system, which, um, as you have mentioned, was never really built for women. It was built for men. And yes, exactly. Built for men. And yet we have many, many women who are in there. And those of us who live in the free world in our communities usually know very little about the the what I now call or try to call the criminal legal system because it's actually lacking in justice. And I think it's really important for those of us living in society to, we want to understand how our hospitals work, how our schools work, how our city government works. We also need to know how this system works. Yes, uh, we do. Uh, you know, when we think of women, they're not called um bad women they're actually called failed women that they yes. failed which is totally different from what a male uh who's been convicted of anything and and uh actually now is free is called um i just want to read a couple of uh sure. stats that you have in in the book male versus female incarceration and 2019, 92% of all incarcerated people in the United States were male. Um, since 1980, the number of incarcerated women has grown by 700%, double the rate of men. Uh, and one of the things that I, I really, the parental status I think is very, very important. 58% of incarcerated women are parents of minor children versus 46% of incarcerated men. 39% of incarcerated mothers with minor children live in single parent-led households versus 21% of incarcerated fathers with minor children. 52% of incarcerated women lived with their children prior to their imprisonment versus 40% of incarcerated men. Because of this, incarceration of women is more likely to uproot children, terminate parental rights, and permanently break up families. Um, those are quite amazing, startling statistics when you take a look at it. Yes, when you think about how many children are impacted by this, because so many of the women were the custodial parent. So we have men who were parents Few of them were the custodial parent or a single father. So when a woman is incarcerated, where are her children going? And most men, when a woman's incarcerated, most men do not become the primary parent. The children are left to either fall into the system, the foster care system, and we know how problematic that is, or there might be a relative who will take them 
but often not. And particularly if they're multiple children, most people aren't prepared to take on three or four extra children. So you begin to see, I think it's, it's over a million children, close to a million and a half children who are impacted by their mother's incarceration. It's a huge and number of children. It's huge. huge. And I want to talk about Orange is the, is the New Black in a minute, but one of the things that what people don't understand is that if someone is accused of a crime, whether it be a minor crime or, or a felony, the court system is such where, you know, they start off with, um, they're, they're imprisoned, they have, uh, you know, they, they get a hearing and then they can post bail or bond. And most of these women cannot do that. Exactly. So, and this is very different than men. When a man goes to post bond, the women in his life rally around to help him make bond. When a woman is ready to post bond, the men in her life do not rally around and try to help her post bond. And so we see many more women because they're financially, they're marginalized. They don't have the money for the bond to be able to get out while they're waiting for a court date. So we see these families impacted by women who have not been sentenced, who have not been found guilty, but their families are being impacted immediately. And a lot of them, because of the fact that they have a family, because of the fact that they don't have any money, will wind up pleading, even if they're not guilty. Yes. They'll, they'll plead because they feel they have no other choice and maybe they'll get out sooner. Right, right. People don't realize, we watch too much TV, right? We think that everybody goes to court, people get lawyers, so forth. We're talking about a group of women who predominantly will do a plea bargain. The majority of cases end in plea bargains, by the way. The majority of cases do not go to court. And women are often told, if you'll plea, we'll plea down your sentence. And so I met, you know, I interviewed a number of women and I met women who said, I really wasn't guilty. However, I was so afraid that I might have to go for 20 years that they said if I would take a plea deal, I would go to prison for seven. I mean, it's not it's not a good option, you know? No, and, and again, they don't have the money, they don't have the time because they want to take care of their family. Exactly. Um, and so they're, they're stuck in, in this place where they take what they're being told right. by the people who want to incarcerate them and, and get on to the next case is the best thing for them to do. Exactly, exactly. So there's so many places like that where that's why I say it's not really justice. You know, this is a flawed system. It's a system that is flawed. It's a system we know that doesn't work. Punishment doesn't work. It has different impacts on different communities. You know, for a woman of color, a woman without financial resources, a woman with a lack of education, your risks are far greater being in this system than for someone who has resources. Well, you mentioned we watch too much television. <laughs> Tell us about Orange is the New Black, hit TV series. What does it get wrong other than the fact that, you know, that's, yes. <laughs> Tell us what it gets. Okay. Well, Orange is the New Black, the book, Piper's book, I think got it right. When they started the series, <clears throat> the first season, I thought that was okay. But as the seasons went on, it became more and more sensationalized, more violence and more sex. And that really isn't exactly what women's prisons look like. Yes, um, women do have relationships with each other at times. Um, yes, um, there can be violence, but the, the show just, um, as it went on, I guess to keep viewers, I think it became more and more incorrect. And so part of what I wanted to do with Hidden Healers is to 
give women a voice. So we hear from the women about their experiences. We track them from coming into the system to getting out of the system, but also to show how women really survive this. And they survive it not because of staff. They survive it because of how they help each other. And I don't think that's something people would normally think of, particularly after seeing Orange is the New Black. Exactly. So tell us, yes, because they sensationalize it, as you said, the first season, and then it goes on and on and on in order to keep their viewers. Right. And you see this, you know, that everyone loves to see a cat fight. Right. So, so of course, it's all sensationalized. And that's right. what people come back. So then their view, their perspective, their, their assumption is that all these women are like that. Um, that's how they live, like fighting cats and dogs. And right. that's why they're considered failed women and women you don't want to go near when they do get out. And well, it's ridiculous. What, what we actually know is like so many of the women that I interviewed who were formerly incarcerated, they're working in human services now. They're working in shelters. They're working in addiction treatment programs they're providing services in the community. And they were also women who provided help to other women on the inside. And some of these women were incarcerated for 15, 20, 25 years. So imagine what it would be like, Sylvia, to be out of society for 25 years and then come back and what it would take to adjust to a world with simple things changing, no pay phones, right? People are hardly using cash. Uh, like one woman said, she couldn't believe the prices of things. 25 years is a huge time to not live in community and try to readjust and come out with nothing. So not only are these women doing major positive things inside the prison, they come out. Um, not, I mean, some people come out in worse shape. But some women come out very committed to um, being a positive force in in their communities. These are these are the women you actually want to live next door to. Well, we started off by saying the system was built for men; it was not built for women. Can you explain that? Go into that a little bit more. Sure, it's on multiple levels. So it was built to be a system of punishment. It was um, obviously was designed for men. Women, particularly in the 80s, got caught up in that system even more so uh, because of our uh, war on drugs. We were going to incarcerate all these drug lords. Instead, of what they picked up were a lot of low-level drug users. Um, brought it into a system that even today in some states, I'll give you some simple um, examples. Women's uniforms are cut on the patterns of men's uniforms, so they don't fit the women. Um, that getting the kinds of hygiene supplies you need as a woman, sometimes correctional officers will withhold those from women. Um, the programming that's developed for women, far fewer programs for women than men. Uh, in one state, for example, they had a parenting program for dads where a dad could go into this room, soundproof room with equipment and read a story to his child. And that story would be sent home to the child to hear the dad's voice. For the women, we couldn't even get a cassette tape. We couldn't get the supplies to even try for the women. But in the same state, the men had a sound booth and all this stuff. Um, it just goes on and on and on. Getting medical care. If you're pregnant, we know as a pregnant woman, you're, you should have certain vitamins. You should have a different kind of diet. Most places will not provide that. Uh, getting health care is very challenging for women inside. So it's just every place you look, um, Part of the reason women gain so much weight is because the meal plans are provided for men with a lot of carbohydrates, too many calories for women, too carb loaded. You know, just, I can't even tell you, every place you look, 
it's been designed for a man and not for a woman and not for a woman with children the visiting rooms <laughs> a woman goes to the visiting room and for many places the visiting room is this very sterile room with um you know, like for Micah, plastic covered tables and metal chairs, nothing for children to do. There might be a vending machine with junk food. So imagine children driving for several hours, because most prisons are not located near where people live, driving for several hours with a relative to come into this harsh environment to see their mother with nothing to do. Many places won't let you bring in a toy or a coloring book or a crayon. Um, I've had women tell me things like, I can't visit, I can't go to the visiting room again. And that's because they do cavity searches every time a woman leaves the visiting room to make sure she doesn't have drugs on her. For a woman who's a sexual abuse survivor, some women, they can't tolerate that over and over again. So, I mean, I just have so many examples of of the, how how about the experience you know into the 80s when I went into a prison because I wanted to see what it was like and the women said to me did you get toilet paper and I said well I'm sure there's some in the bathroom they said oh no we're given one roll every two weeks and when I later asked the warden how did they figure out one roll every two she said that's how much the men get well, think about the difference in the amount of toilet paper a woman would use than a man would use. And we're talking such, you know, when somebody does something wrong and they're sent to prison, yes, they're supposed to, it, it, it's, they're supposed to pay in a sense for right. the crime that they've done. But we're also supposed to be getting them on a road to being able to have finished their sentence and go back out into society. And all we're doing is tearing them down bit by bit by bit right. by taking away the fact that they are a woman. Right. Yes, those are guilty. They did something wrong. They're paying for it, but they're paying for it in a way that is so different then the men are paying for it. Right, exactly. And and the rule, some of the rules and regular, I mean, they're they're stupid as well as inhumane. You know what I mean? It just it it doesn't make any sense. The thing right now that I also find really interesting is we talk about reentry. Okay, people are coming out of prison and how do we help them reenter? And so when you talk to women and you ask them, okay, what do you need? They talk about services for domestic violence, education, job skills, um, drug treatment, a whole variety, help with their histories of trauma. Those are exactly the same things that if we gave women those things up front in our communities, most of them wouldn't go to prison. Those are the services they needed before they got there. And now we talk about maybe providing them after they get out. But even reentry services have been designed for men. You know, I mean, it's just this it just goes on and on and on. Think, think about it. Someone comes out of prison, more people will let a man flop on their sofa for a week or two until he gets a job than they'll let a woman do that because she very often has children now that the state's trying to get her reconnected to. And she may have an old violent boyfriend around. And so people are much more hesitant letting a woman who's been in prison come into their home than a man. You know, we've seen the news has done uh, a lot of uh, um, segments on men reentering and how, you know, tough it is. They only get a few dollars. They have no identity, um, right. ID and so on. You've never, at least I never have seen anything that has one story about a woman. No, we keep the women invisible. These are the most invisible women in our society are the women behind the walls. We don't talk about them. Well, other than orange is a new black, but you won't see them in any 
shows on TV about reentry or about what happens to people. You'll see a lot of shows lock up about what's happening to men in prison or men coming out, but it's very focused on the men. And that, you know, when someone's invisible, that usually means they're not getting what they need. And, you know, psychologically, I mean, when you get down to the fact that they don't have the hygiene products that are necessary for a woman, um, that's horrific. This is how basic it is. Can you imagine being, you're locked up, you have rules to follow, the correctional officers are essentially in charge of your life, and now you have to negotiate that with them? Sometimes you have to negotiate for phone time. You have to negotiate for the hygiene products. You have to negotiate all kinds of things. And very often for the correctional officers that are really unethical, you can imagine what they're trading for. Where do we go from here? What would, what are some of the first steps that we can do to address this? Because as this keeps going on and, 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 you know, as people had lost their jobs during the pandemic and so on and so forth, it, it's almost like we're asking for trouble. I mean, how are, how is anyone going to reenter um, when they have, they've been given no, it's not even no direction while they were in prison. They've been treated like, um, uh, uh, they're not a woman. They, they don't exist. Exactly. Exactly. I think there are multiple things we can do. I think one of the things we all need to do, in whatever community we're living in, we need to pay attention to the people we vote for and how they vote on the legislation and the rules around prisons. We need to pay attention. Most of us pay no attention to that. It's not something we pay attention to. The other thing we can do is every community, most communities have local jails. Every state has a prison system. You can decide if you wanna be a volunteer. You can be a volunteer by joining a pen pal club, writing to women. I can't tell you women who receive letters from the outside, what it does for their self-esteem. Somebody cares about me. Someone knows that I exist and they share it. So if I write a letter to a woman in a prison, she will share it with 20 other women. Okay. If you're someone who reads a lot and you have extra books, you can call your local jail or prison and say, I'd like to volunteer and give donations of some books to your library. Most places have libraries, but they have books that you and I haven't seen for 20 years. You know, they're not exactly current. Um, if you're somebody who is a yoga teacher, you can see if they'll let you bring a yoga class in. There's all kinds of things that we can do. And one of the things that, you know, I write about these at the, at the back of the book, and also we can financially support organizations that are working to help women. There's a whole list of organizations trying to do things to help the women who are incarcerated. There are organizations trying to get de-incarceration, encouraging places to put fewer women in. Most of the women inside our prisons in this country could be supervised in the community. Every time I go into a prison, I ask the warden, what percentage of the women here do you think could be supervised in the community? And you know the number I'm usually given? 75% by the wardens. They don't believe all the women need to be in there. That's a huge percentage. And huge. is that we're paying a lot of money oh. to keep these women behind. The children aren't being taken care of. Families are being broken, broken Communities up. Communities are being devastated. The cost, California spends more for its criminal legal system than it does for its education system. These it's women... right now, the budget I think is $8 billion now in one state. 
And you have to understand that other countries are doing this differently. This, this, this isn't what happens everywhere. There are some countries that if a woman is pregnant, she goes to the judge. When she's sentenced, the judge will say, after your child is a year old, come back and then we'll talk about your sentence because they don't want to separate the baby from the mother. European women's prisons have baby nurseries in case a woman gives birth, the baby can stay with her in the prison for at least a year. In, this, in California, we have six states that have baby nurseries. In Europe, that's considered an essential part of a women's prison. Nobody does it the way we do it. Nobody looks to us as how to treat women in the criminal legal system. Well, I can hear your passion. Um, it's pretty devastating to really hear how we treat, as you said, you know, these are, they're hidden, they're hidden. I mean, they're just hidden away and nobody talks about it. What no. brought you on to be so passionate about women and specifically women in, in this position? Well, initially I got into the whole um, field of working with women, women with addictive disorders, and that came out of my own experience with alcoholism. And I real, I went back to school, I had a master's degree, but I got a PhD in psychology had a private practice working with addicted women. And I was in North Carolina at a conference on women and addiction. And during the break, standing in a circle of women and all the attendees had on name tags. And this woman's name tag said, warden. And I said, warden, warden of what? And she said, warden of our local women's prison. I said, I'm doing all this work around women and I've never thought about women in prison. I mean, I was just sort of startled, much like you, the invisibility. And she said, what do you think? I said, I'll bet most of them have kids. I'll bet most of them have problems with alcohol and drugs. I bet most of them have an abuse history. So she said, see, you know a lot. And I was so struck by this and she said tonight when you give your talk in the community i'm bringing six or eight honorees out of the prison to hear you so now that night now i'm standing in a circle nine o'clock at night with a warden and about seven or eight women and this thought goes through my head why are you in there and i'm out here and the next thing that went through my head was privilege and I thought, you know, if you're white and you are educated and you come from a family with resources, your chances of being in there are so slim. And I flew back to California from North Carolina and I was haunted by it. So I called her up and I said, next year when I come back to speak at the women's conference, I'd like to do something in the prison. She said, okay. And I said, well, tell me about programs. She said, we don't program. We don't, we don't do any programs. So I, said, well, I said, well, okay. I said, I guess I'll run some groups. She said, fine. Then I called her back and I said, you know, I'd like to live in the prison. And she said, it's not a hotel. <laughs> I said, I know. She said, I, I can't let you do. I said, there has to be a way. So I basically, quite honestly, kind of stalked her every three weeks <laughs> and bugged her. And finally, she said, I'm going to leave this job. I can't get permission, but I'm going to leave this job. So I'm willing to take the risk of letting you come in because if they fire me, it's okay. So I got to go into this minimum security facility in North Carolina um, for several days. Now, my experience, you know, I knew I was coming out, so I, right. I'm not saying it was the same. But my few days in there changed my life. At the time, I was the consultant to the Betty Ford Center. I was redesigning women's treatment. And that was the trajectory of my work life. And I came out of that experience saying, working with women in prison, that's my job. That's what I want to do. And I didn't know what that was going to mean. I didn't know anybody who did that kind of work. But I knew that's where that was my direction. And when I came out of that prison, in my head, I thought someday 
I'm going to write a book called Hidden Healers. And that was 30 years ago. So I had a title for a manuscript <laughs> before I had the manuscript. But because of what I saw was how the women helped each other. I saw how the women helped me. They're the ones that told me how to manage, right? Did they give me soap? Yes. Oh, don't use it on your hands and face. Only wash your sneakers with it. It takes the skin off. They're the ones that asked me about the toilet paper. They're the ones that when I went through the food line and went to reach for an apple, they said, oh, no, 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 the fresh fruit's only for the staff. They're the ones that helped me navigate my days. So that's that's how I got into this. It's one heck of a way of getting into it and, and finding your, your passion. I found my, yes, exactly, exactly. Where can people find out more about you? Uh, I have a website. It's www.stephaniecovington.com. There's Instagram, those, all those kinds of things. We have a newsletter you can sign up for. We have a lot of trainings we do um, on material and the books that I've written and every everything's on there. Um, the audio book for uh, Hidden Healer should be out in a week or two. Um, and so there's there are a variety of things out there, you know, that you can see what I've been up to. Again, the book is Hidden Healers, The Unexpected Ways Women in Prison Help Each Other Survive. Stephanie, I want to thank you for being here today and talking about something that's not really talked about, but should be. Well, and I'm so glad, Sylvia, you invited me. It's, it's really been enjoyable. So thank you very much for helping me um, let people know about these women that we don't see. Thank you. You can find us on all of your popular podcast platforms. And of course, our website, sylviaandme.com. Stay safe, stay healthy, and as always, stay tuned.